Hi everyone, welcome to the Landing Factor webinar. My name is Joel and I'm a senior weight and balance analyst here at APG and I've been with the company for about five years now. Today I'm, be, I'm going to be go discussing the different landing factors which the FAA and EASA require to be calculated. I brought on a couple colleagues that will help answer any questions as I'm going through the presentation. Please use the Q&A section located on the right hand side of your screen to ask these questions. What EA, FAA and EAS regulations define these landing factor requirements? You can find the landing factor requirements in FAA regulation 135.385 Bravo and EASA cat pull A230 for dry and cat pull A235 for wet contaminated. The FAA says no person operating a turbine engine powered large transport category airplane may take off that airplane unless its weight on arrival allowing for normal consumption of fuel and oil in flight in accordance with the landing distance in the airplane flight manual for the elevation of the destination airport and the wind conditions expected there at the time of landing would allow a full stop landing at the intended destination airport within 60% of the effective length of each runway described below from a point 50 feet above the intersection of the obstruction clearance plane and the runway. So how do you calculate the 60% factor that both regulations require? Let's say you have a landing distance available LDA of 5000 feet. If this is the case, then you must be able to stop your aircraft in 3,000 feet. Now there are two ways to apply this rule. The first is to apply the landing factor to the LDA, 5,000 feet times 0.6, and choose a landing weight that results in an unfactored landing distance less than 3,000 feet. The second option is to choose a landing weight and factor the landing distance and compare this to the unfactored LDA. In the second option, this is done either by dividing the unfactored landing distance required derived by the AFM by 0.6, or often pilots will multiply this value by 1.67 for simplicity, since one divided by 0.6 equals 1.66 repeating, which rounds to 1.67. In the first case, you follow the AFM and come up with an unfactored landing distance needed of 2,250 feet. This is less than the 3,000 foot factored LDA, so we know we are safe to land. Alternatively, you can either compute 2,250 divided by 0 0.6, which equals 3,750 feet, or 2,250 times 1.67, which equals 3,758. Since both of these numbers are less than the 5,000 foot LDA, it is safe to land. It is overly conservative to compare the factor distance of 3,750 and 3,758 to the factored LDA of 3,000 feet, since you will be applying the rule twice. When calculating an 80% factor, which is defined in FAA 135.385 Foxtrot 2 and Catpole A255, you will do the same calculations as a 60%, except using 0.8 instead of 0.6. If your LDA is again 5,000 feet, then you must be able to stop your aircraft in 4,000 feet, 5,000 times 0.8 equals 4,000 feet. If the required unfactored landing distance from the AFM is 2,250 feet, you can either divide this value by 0.8 or multiply it by 1.25, since 1 divided by 0.8 equals 1.25. Both result in a required field length of 2,812.5 feet. Eligible on-demand operators can use the 80% factor. The unfactored landing distance, which is used by Part 91 operators, is the direct computation from the AFM without a landing factor applied. 
Please note, turboprop operators must use a 70% landing factor, which comes from FAA 135.385, Charlie. So what does the FAA say about a wet runway? The answer for this depends on whether you are talking about wet for dispatch or in route wet assessment. When planning to dispatch to a wet runway, FAA 135.385 states, no person may take off a turbojet airplane when the appropriate weather reports or forecasts or any combination of them indicate that the runways at the destination airport may be wet or slippery at the estimated time of arrival unless the effective runway length at the destination airport is at least 115% of the runway length required under paragraph B of this section. This means you must take your calculated 60% landing factor and multiply it by 1.15. In the previous example, we calculated a 2,250 foot landing distance and 3,758 foot factor landing distance. 2,250 times 1.67. So for the dispatch distance, we will take the 3,758 foot distance, multiply it by 1.15, so 3,758 times 1.5, which gives you 4,321.125 feet. This means your dispatch landing distance is now 4,321 feet which is below the 5,000 foot available, so you're still able to land. If the 115% is for dispatching, what about FAA in route? The FAA does not actually have any specific regulations for an in route landing assessment, but they have released SAFO 19003, Turbojet Braking Performance on Wet Runways, and SAFO 19001 landing performance assessments at time of arrival. In SAFO 19001, the FAA says, additionally, the FAA highly encourages operators to use their FAA approved landing performance data and any associated manufacturer provided supplement supplemental advisory data in concert with AC 91-79 generated our CAM braking action codes to conduct an adequate landing distance assessment at the time of arrival. This is particularly important when the landing runway is contaminated or not the same runway analyzed for, for pre-flight calculations. This is something that APG highly encourages to be ran in or out before landing once the actual landing conditions are known if the AFM gives the data for it. For EOS operators, this information is defined in CAT Poll A 235. And at the end of the year, there will be some changes being made to this regulation, and those changes are what I'm going to be going to go over today. The regulation has basically been rewritten, and the effect is very minimal on contaminated runway calculations, but significant to wet runways. On a wet runway, the new regulation says that if there is no specific wet landing distance available in the AFM, then the calculation remains unchanged. Your dry landing distance times 1.15 divided by the required factor from CATPOL A230, A1, or A2. If there is a specific wet landing distance data available in the AFM, smooth or grooved, then multiple calculations must be performed, and the longest of these calculations must be used as the required landing distance. So your dry landing distance divided by required factor from capital A, 230, A1, or A2, and your wet AFM distance. APG has created a couple diagrams to help show these changes. The calculation of the wet AFM landing distance does not include a required factor from CATPOL A230, nor 15% safety factor. With this in mind, please note that APG will be evaluating any wet landing data provided in an AFM, and if the data provided is strictly the dry data increased by 15%, APG will not treat this data as specific wet landing data 
and instead APG will act like know what data is available on from the AFM. On a contaminated runway, the material has not changed from the previous version. Multiple calculations must be performed and the longest of these calculations must be used as the required landing distance. Your required wet landing distance as calculated in the previous section, contaminated landing distance times 1.15. The calculation of the contaminated landing distance does not include a required factor from capital A230, only the increased safety factor of 1.15. Here's another depiction of how the EOS contams are calculated. It shows that the 60, 70, and 80% factors are not directly applied to the distances. APG is checking if the contam data includes the 15% safety factor, and if so, is, the long, is this longer than the wet dispatch data? The other change is there is a new regulation, which is CATPOL, cat.op.mpa.303. This new regulation reiterates the need for an operator to reevaluate the landing performance prior to landing and that a minimum, minimum of a 15% safety factor should be included in all calculations. After reading the new regulation, it indicates to APG that for the calculation of the landing distance at time of arrival, supplemental information outside of the AFM such as from an operations manual or other qualified source, should be used when available. This is often the case when the landing distance in the AFM assumes no slope and ISA temperature, but the operating manual or other source from the manufacturer includes landing data that does not account for slope and temperature. How will APG be accounting for these changes? Changes for dry calculations will be limited to evaluating source of landing distance data and what corrections may or may not currently be applied. APG does generally account for all corrections provided in the AFM, but we will need to look at any custom data files that may have these corrections omitted and reintroduce them if they are for EOS operators. For wet and contaminated runway calculations, APG currently has an EASA Ops calculation method that can be turned on on a per tail basis for the calculation based on CATPOL A235 regulations so that our operators will not need to perform multiple calculations for each analysis. As these regulations have changed, the calculation method will need to be updated accordingly. APG is still discussing internally how to handle these new changes that YASA will be requiring. We have already started updating aircraft profiles to handle these new calculations and we'll be adding an in-flight assessment calculation page within our systems. I will now answer some questions. I know I covered a lot of material today and there will be other questions that come up. Feel free to email us at support at apgdata.com and we can answer any of those questions. We also have a copy of this presentation available to watch at your convenience, any ASA documentation that outlines the new changes. Just email us requesting this information.